These are the most interesting boots that we've ever car cut apart on the channel. And I'm willing to bet that you've never seen a boot built quite like this before. Out of all the hundreds of boots that we've cut apart, we've never seen one built in this way. And you might look at this boot and think like, oh, that looks like a vintage boot that was maybe handmade, bespoke, made to the person's foot, cost a lot of money. But in reality, as you probably already know from the title and thumbnail, this is a vintage military boot from World War II from the Japanese army. And they're crazy. And I think even cobblers and the, their nerdiest boot nerds are gonna learn some stuff from this video. And this video is sponsored by Shopify. Shopify is the website platform that I built my website on and really love and enjoy. Because Shopify offers an easy to use all-in-one commerce platform for anyone regardless of technical ability and experience to start, grow, and manage your business. And it's just full of features. It's got email campaigns, it's got in-depth analysis and analytics on every little thing you can imagine, whether it's how often a, sell, a product selling, how many times people have clicked, how many people are on your site, how fast they, they uh, leave your site, how fast the, the product pages load, what you can do to optimize your website. They have empty cart retargeting campaigns that can be automated. And there's just tons of features that are useful for not only just running a website and a business, but to more importantly, to grow your, your business. And I haven't even mentioned what most people like about Shopify is how easy it is to build a website. Not only maintain it, but to build it because it's a really simple drag and drop upload. It's based off of templates. So you can make your website exactly how you want. And it's really fun to do, to be honest. Like I've built several side websites that never got launched just because I like the branding and the reorganization and making a website. And the coolest thing about Shopify coming from a small business owner that uses Shopify is it's the perfect tool for entrepreneurs because it, it's affordable. It's really easy to use. It has everything rolled into one. And if you have a business idea, it's the easiest and most effective way to get your message out there and sell your products because it's really affordable for how many features you actually get. Be sure to use the links in the description and the code below so that we get credit for it. So let's sponsor more videos. So thanks again to Shopify. So this is episode number four of the World War II boot series. And the last one we did was the German boot, which got demonetized after two weeks of being posted and being monetized and great feedback. People really love the video. We're getting 50,000 views a day. It was the best performing video we've ever posted. It was gonna be, it was training to be our most successful video ever. And then two weeks in, it got demonetized by YouTube. And we didn't say any naughty words throughout the entire video. There was no bad footage. We just used one word in the title and it completely demonetized the video. And we went from 50,000 views a day to 300 views a day. So that video is completely shut down. So if you haven't seen that one, you're gonna have to go on the channel to go find it because it's a really good video. And I think we did a really good job of it. And it's unfortunately being uh, punished by YouTube. So hopefully that doesn't happen to this video as well because these take a lot of work. They're expensive and it's a bummer that historical videos are they get demonetized. I get it, but it just sucks at the end of the day. So thanks for supporting this series. It's one of my favorite things we've ever done on the channel. So thank you guys for your support. Enough complaining. Let's get back to the boot. So in World War II, there's basically three different types of boots that the Japanese military wore. There was the tabby boot that had like the split toe. That's actually kind of cool. And uh, they had the higher boot that was very similar to the boot that we made a video on that got demonetized and they had this boot. This was their boots on the ground, standard issue. Most of the soldiers were wearing a boot very similar to this. It came from their M98 standard uniform that was introduced in 1938. And it came in several different sole options. It had Some of them had spikes, some of them had hobnails, some of them had leather soles, some of them had rubber soles, and they're just kind of all over the place, just like all these mil uh, World War II military boots. So this should be a really good representation of what the Japanese soldiers were actually wearing during World War II. So now start going through the details, starting with the leather first. And the leather alone is already super interesting. There's so many little interesting details about it. First and foremost, it's pigskin. You know, every other boot that we've cut apart basically on the whole channel, except for like the kangaroo boot and a couple of ostrich skin has been all cowhide. And so you'd assume for a World War II boot, it would be made out of cowhide because it's such a popular uh, material for making boots out of, but this is pigskin. So how do I know it's a pigskin? Well, if you look really closely at the pore pattern, the pores are a lot bigger and more spread out than cowhide because pigs have a lot coarser hair and it's a lot more sparse than cowhide. And if you look at a side-by-side -side comparison, it's super obvious when you actually know what you're looking for when you're looking at pig compared to cow. And I've never owned a pair of pigskin boots, but I have owned a lot of pairs of pigskin work gloves and cowhide work gloves. And there are some distinct advantages for pigskin than why you'd want to choose it over cowhide. It's thinner, it's allegedly stronger at these thinner thicknesses. It has a lot tighter grain pattern and fiber structure, so it's, so it's a lot less fuzzy than the flesh side of cowhide. 
so much that like you look at this boot and you might assume that this is the grain side because of how flat and smooth it is but then you look on the inside and this is clearly the grain side that's the smooth side that everyone associates with that texture of leather and this outside is that typical suede that you see on the reverse side of leather and so that just shows you side by side comparing a regular work boot that uses a flesh out leather compared to this flesh out this is way less fuzzy and one of those advantages is that it's super flexible and pliable and thin but strong because if we take a quick measurement of these different parts of the leather it's kind of all over the place because you got one side of the boot that's really thick at 2.5 millimeters which is what we see in work boots then the other side is only 1.5 millimeter and so you we have varying thicknesses from three millimeters down to 1.2 millimeter across the entire boot and that's one of the flaws of pig skin compared to cowhide because pigs are so much smaller you don't have as much usable area there's not as many big spots that have consistent thicknesses throughout the entire hide like a 25 square foot cowhide does and one thing i almost didn't notice and that's a really interesting detail is there's numbers stamped on the outside here that you almost can't see until you look on the inside the numbers are 10.7 which we couldn't figure out what it was until we finally discovered that it was the sizing they used back then they used they used to use a mon sizing system and this was a 10.7 mon and i really like the fact that they punched all the way through the upper because this is going to stay visible as long as this boot is around you know versus how most people mark their boots it's on the inside collar they stamp it in there and after you've worn them for six months you can barely see what it says there's no way this is going anywhere and I, that's and that's kind of the theme of the entire boot it's how do we make this thing as effective and efficiently as possible and as simple as possible and there's some other features that seem like it's right in line with that but i have no idea what they do like if you look at the pull tab on the back here you've got a hole punch at the top with a slit all the way through it and i don't think it's for sticking your finger in there and having a grip to pull on it i th it seems like it's supposed to connect to something or like uh, maybe you connect the two boots together or maybe the gaiters attached to it so if you know what this is for let me know because i have no idea and speaking of the simplicity of this boot there's no lining throughout this entire boot you know it's pretty common to see no lining in the shaft of the boot but usually there's a vamp lining but there's no lining at all in this boot so once again they've removed all the unnecessary parts and just kept it as simple as possible for the functionality that it was intended for and this is that echoed across the entire boot because you see there's a it's an unstructured toe box no toe stiffener because it's not needed it does have a gusseted tongue which is needed for war but it's as simple as a sewing job as possible to get that fully gusseted tongue on there and the stitching across the entire boot is really simple you've only got a couple lines of stitching to connect the vamp to the upper same with the heel counter the heel counter itself is a single piece and just a simple stitch line around the heel to keep that counter in place and you'll notice there's a little teeny hole right at the heel that's off center and it's on both boots and i think what that is is when you're lasting a boot a lot of times these cobblers will tack the upper to the last with a little nail in the back you know we've seen it in john lofgren boots it's almost something that they've advertised almost because it is a sign of a handmade boot um, another thing is it's only got five eyelets for this tall of a boot you can see how spaced out these eyelets are and so this boot is just as simple as it gets until you get to the sole construction because then the whole thing changes it's no longer about simplicity and the ease of manufacturing and removing all the unnecessary bits it gets super complicated so if we look at the outsole first you'll notice that it's a half sole and a leather half sole i think it's the first leather half sole we've ever seen and we've seen rubber half soles like on this two thousand dollar pair of viberg and horween cordovan boots that we did a video on, on the second channel I'll put a link below but i've never seen a leather half sole before and it also has a full leather heel stack with all these studs driven into it to help keep that block in place and i think more than anything it's just to help prevent extra wear for the heel stack and you'll notice that there's tons of stitching all over the place with this boot there's two lines here there's a stitch around the toe there's there's pegs throughout the half sole so what is going on with the construction of this boot how was it built so this is my third attempt at trying to record this and make it consumable and make it make any sense so wish me luck so the way this boot is built is the very first true blake rapid stitch construction we've ever done um, so the best way to describe this is by explaining each piece of the construction so what is a blake stitch a blake stitch is a structural stitch that sews through the insole the upper that's tucked in the midsole and the outsole and this stitch is done all internally on the inside of the boot and sews all those layers together and is the structural stitch that holds basically the whole boot together so what's different about this japanese boot well usually a blake stitch ends where the heel begins it only wraps around like 270 degrees 
and then the heel is tucked in and nailed like a typical boot. And it's usually only a single Blake stitch. Whereas with this Japanese boot, what's different is the Blake stitch goes all the way around 360 degrees and it's double Blake stitched and it's Blake pegged. In the same way the stitch holds out those layers together, there's pegs holding that layer together as well. And instead of that Blake stitch going all the way through the outsole, it stops at the midsole and then the outsole is sewn on with a different stitch. So how is this outsole attached if it's not through the Blake stitch? Well, it's attached similar to a stitch down boot. So what is a stitch down construction? Well, it's essentially the exact same thing as a Blake stitch construction except for all those internal bits and all that internal sewing, it's flipped to the outside and sewn externally. So these external stitches sew together the upper, the midsole, and the outsole all together in a single stitch, just like the Blake stitch, but externally. So what's different about the Japanese boot? Well, it's basically the exact same except for one vital difference. So on a stitch down construction, you can see the upper is flanged out and sewn in that, in that same stitch. Well, this Japanese boot, that upper is still tucked inside and is not sewn together with that stitch down stitch, which is a rapid stitch. And so this stitch down stitch is only sewing together the midsole and the outsole, and that's how the outsole is attached. So essentially a Blake rapid stitch combines the internal stitching of a Blake stitch with the external stitching of a stitch down, making it a true Blake rapid stitch construction. So basically it's a Blake rapid stitch on steroids. So why would they choose this construction? Well, it makes it very simple to repair the outsole without worrying about any of the internal bits being disrupted, any of the layers coming undone because that Blake stitch holds all those internal bits together and that rapid stitch only holds the outsole on. So all you have to do is cut those stitching, the whole inside of the boot stays the same, pull the outsole off and grab some new outsole material and just do the this single stitch line and your boots are repaired. There's other boots that are just as easy to repair. A lot of the stitch down boots, all you have to do is peel off the outsole and glue a new one on. But the problem is with a stitch down boot, every time you stitch through this upper that's flanged out, you're wearing that upper out, which is gonna eventually lead to a failure. And when you don't have stitching all the way through the outsole, you're only relying on glue to hold this outsole on. Whereas this Blake Rapid Stitch, you have those stitching and the pegs and the glue and it's easy to repair and you're not damaging the upper and you're not damaging the midsole because the midsole is so thick compared to the flanged out upper on a regular stitch down. You could sew on several different outsoles and this midsole would stay just fine. And so it's the, the perfect construction for an extremely durable boot that's also extremely easy to repair. And usually those two values are inverse. The more durable the boot is, the harder it is to repair and the less durable the boot is the easier it is to repair this blake rapid stitch is arguably more durable than a blake stitch stitch down and goodyear welt and arguably easier to repair than all those boots so it ends up making the perfect construction for a war boot so i hope that made sense because i've recorded this edited it three times and i think i think this is the one and now we'll go back to the three day ago three day younger version of me to finish off the video and so it's just really, it's a really cool piece to see how simple you can make an upper and how durable and complex you can make a sole combined on the same boot for the specific purpose of making a boot for war. And I really love that fact. And I, because I always lean towards really liking these boots that have the function before the form, but end up having a really unique form because they prioritize the function first. And this is a prime example of it. And it's the most Japanese example of this because of how perfectly it's designed and how, how much craftsmanship goes into it and how unique the thinking was behind the design of this boot. So now let's cut this thing in half and see what's on the inside and see what other layers we don't know about and if there's any other hidden details that make this boot even more unique and odd.
All right, we got it cut in half, and this was another really stinky one. And this is this might have been the most painful World War II boot for me to cut in half because I love this boot so much. But let's see what's inside. So no metal in the construction at all, except for those studs in the heel. Cause you can see there's a wood shank in here. And the cool part is you can see all these wooden pegs and how they attach that half sole to the midsole and how they attach the shank to the insole and all these different points, even at the heel here where the, where the counter is wrapped underneath the insole, it's pegged there as well. So I love the fact that it's basically a metal free construction. And there's a lot of interesting little details in here. And you can see now that the insole itself is a really thick layer of pigskin, but, but because pigskin's so thin, they had to double it up to equal about the same thickness you see in most boots for the leather insole. And now we can see that it is a full leather heel block and it's not just a block of leather nailed on there. It's expertly skived and shaped to fit the heel of this boot perfectly because you can see the little wedges of leather throughout the top layers. And that's just another example of how complex everything from the insole down is with all these different stitching and pegs and everything going on juxtaposed against how simple the construction of the upper is. Like it's, it literally only has like five or six, five or six stitch lines and like three or four pieces. And the amount of craftsmanship that went into making this boot is more than most boot makers put in today on these high-end bespoke boots. And, and this is a standard issue military boot from 80 years ago. And you can still see that today, even in my small area of expertise, all the best denim comes from Japan. Some of the best boots come from Japan. Arguably the best leather is tanned in Japan. Basically all the handmade goods in the world, the best come from Japan. But you can still see a lot of these trends that were established 100 years ago in this craftsmanship culture that's been around for centuries, still echoed in World War II all the way up to the present time. And I really, really want a almost exact replica of this boot. And I think that you guys would probably want one too. So if you are a boot manufacturer out there and you want to collab on a limited run of these, I really want a boot just like this, made in the same way, made to the same standards, the simplicity and the complexity combined. It's just, it's its probably my favorite boot I've ever cut apart because of how unique it is and how perfectly built it is and how odd it is. So let me know what you guys think and so far, which boot is your favorite boot of the World War II series and which one do you think is the highest quality? Because I'm really curious which one you guys think is the best World War II boot because we're getting closer to the end of this series. We've got the Soviet Union boot left and we might revisit the German boot. We'll see, it, was, it would be a bummer to, to get another boot and just have it demonetized, but uh, whatever. I appreciate your guys' support and I, I hope you liked this boot as much as I did because this was one of my favorite videos to make. So thank you guys so much for everything you do and all the support and don't forget the White's collab drops September 15th where we have a kit that you can sew on your own knife pocket. That boot turned out super good and they're only doing 200 pairs of them. So sign up for the limited edition email list below which will also let you know if we ever do a collab on these. So thank you guys. See ya.